God is good. And there is none like him. There's no one that comes close to him. There's none more powerful than what he is. There is no father that is a father like him. And it is our honor and our privilege to be able to bow before him, to be able to be called children of the Most High God. It is a privilege, to be called a child of God. There are so many people I remember quite a while back, but I remember something that was on the television where I think it was some of the program that they were um, gathering statistics and stuff for. And there was a man standing, and I don't know in what country it was, probably America, I think. But he was standing with a microphone, and obviously then there was a cameraman as well. And he would walk up to each person that was passing by him, and he would ask, what religion are you? What faith are you? And 99% of the people that walked past said, oh, no, I'm Christian. I wonder how many of them really, really, really knew Jesus. Because you see, so many people say, no, I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. But they don't live it. It comes out of their mouth, but it is not part of their deeds or of their life. They think, okay, if you're not Muslim, you must be Christian. If you're not um, Jehovah Witness, you must be Christian. If you're not uh, a Satanist, you must be Christian. So whether they serve the Lord or not, they're Christian. And that's not how it works. Because God has his rules and regulations in this book. And then he says, but... My yoke is light. So it's not a burden to be a child of God. It is a privilege to be a child of God. And as soon as we start to realize it's a privilege that God wants to use you to do things, the world will stay as it is until we, the Word of God says, until we, as children of the Most High God, will stand up and be counted. We'll stand up and do what we are purposed to do. Until then, the world will stay as it is or even get worse. We need to stand up and do what God has called us to do. Amen? Okay, this morning I want to talk about the second commandment that we have in the Word. Any of you know the second commandment? The first one? You must love God with everything you are, with everything you do, and there's no other like Him. You cannot serve two gods. You cannot serve five gods. If we look at the religion of Hinduism, they serve any god. They have many gods. They even have our god as one of their gods. So they think. But we, we serve one god. And our first commandment in the Bible is to love God with everything that you are. And then he says, and then the second commandment is like the first, but it is to love your neighbor. And he says, it is like the first. So as much as you love God, you are also supposed to love your neighbor as best you can and with everything. And then he says, 
loving your neighbor like you love yourself. You see, we're supposed to love ourselves. We're supposed to like the way God made us. It's not being vain to love yourself. The Word of God says you must love yourself. You see, you must be um, happy. You must be privileged. You must, you must love yourself and, and there's nothing wrong with it. We're supposed to love ourselves. Then he says, but you must love your neighbor like you love yourself. And I want to talk about that one, the second commandment, to love your neighbor. Let's consider the character of God, first of all. Who is God and what is his character? Now, the character of God is so easily portrayed in his names that he has. And throughout the Bible, you can get all of his names. If he says a part of his character, his name is Jehovah Raphi, then what does that tell us about his character? It tells us that he is a God that heals people. That's part of his character. It's something that he does, and he does it with love and with everything in him. Then we get another one, Jehovah Jireh. And we think, okay, what, what character of God does that portray to us? He is our provider. He loves to give. It's part of him. It's who he is. It's part of his character. He loves to give. And his name tells us that. And you can go through all of the names. Jehovah Shalom. He is the, the, the king of priests. He is our high priest. He loves to, to fill you, to saturate you with his peace. That peace that surpasses all understanding. The people will look at you going through some or other trial and they, they will think to themselves, but how do you make it? Why aren't you in a frenzy? Why isn't it chaos in your life? You're going through the most difficult thing anyone can go through, and yet you're peaceful. Because you see, it's part of God's character. And God lives in you. And if you allow him his character will fill you as well. God is so perfect that we cannot actually understand it. God is so holy that it's difficult for us to recognize. God is so powerful, yet he made us just as we are. God made us to be his children. Did you get that? God made us, each one of us, to be his children. He didn't make us and then think afterwards, what am I going to do with these things? He didn't do that. He said to Jesus, he said to the Holy Spirit, come here. I want to have a conversation with you. Let us make man in our image. You can go and read it in Genesis. Why? Because a little bit further on, he says, so that they can have dominion. So when we make, make man, let's make him a little planet, a home to live on as well. And let him be taught and let him grow up and be, be um, pruned to be the perfect children that we want as children. You're not an afterthought. God made you exactly the way you are. It was his purpose to make you. So it's important that we love ourselves. He could have made us perfect 
also. He could have. Did you know that God could have made perfect beings in his image? I mean, God can do anything. But he didn't make us perfect. He made us exactly the way he wanted to make us. Why? So that when the time came in your life that you could make choices, he wanted you to willingly make the choice to love him. That's why we're made as we are. We're in his image. We can communicate with him because we communicate in our spirit with him. God is spirit. But he didn't want us not to be able to make choices. He wanted us to make choices. He wanted us to live a life and choose him because we love him. The same as he chose us because he loved us. He could have made us holy. He could have forced us to always be holy. He could have. By not giving us choices. Wouldn't it have been so much easier? All these people running around and whatever he said, yes, Lord, I'll do it. And they went and, and did it. Like robots. But can you imagine how boring it would be? And I think God wanted a little bit of spice in his life. That's why he didn't make us perfect. Because he made us to be able to choose. He made us exactly the way that he wanted us. Say after me, I am exactly the way God wants me. And he accepts us just the way we are. Yeah. And he accepts us the way we are. Why would God make someone like that and then not accept them like that? That's not the God we serve. The God we serve is an awesome God. He's a loving God. He's a powerful God. So thank God that he accepts us exactly the way we are. With all our faults. He loves us just the way we are. There is nothing that you have done. Say after me, there is nothing that I have done that will shock him. You might have done things in your life that you are ashamed of, that you wish you didn't do, that if somebody found out, it would, you would shock them. Let me tell you something. There's nothing that you can do that will shock God. Nothing. He actually knew you were going to do it before you did it. Because he made us. And there is nothing that you will do that can, um, sorry, there is nothing that you will do that can shock him. Nothing, nothing, nothing. There's nothing that you've done that will shock him, and there's nothing that you will do that will shock him. Okay? Don't let the devil steal your joy by putting guilt in you because you've done something that you shouldn't have done. God knows you're going to do it and he forgives you as soon as you bow your knee. You fathers, any fathers in the house? Okay, we're talking to you. You fathers, don't leave your two-year-old to throw a tantrum, am I right? What would happen if this two-year-old of yours started stamping his feet, I want this, I want this. What are you going to do? 
fivefold ministry. Right? Do you think God's any different? We're made in His image. If we do things, throw tantrums that we're not supposed to do, what is God going to do? Discipline. Why do you do that to your child? Because you love him. Why does God do it to us? Because he loves us. You want your child to grow up the best that he can be. Amen? So you discipline him. It even says in the word of God, do not spare the rod. He says so. He wouldn't say something if he didn't do it himself. Amen? You do not teach them to speak or to potty train. They need to survive and grow and mean something in the physical world, right? Why do we teach them? Because they need to survive in this world. They need to grow in this world. And they need to mean something in the physical realm. So we teach them certain things so that they can grow correctly. If you leave a child and do not discipline them and do not teach them, how do they grow up? Definitely not good kids. Definitely not kids that are liked by most people because they're going to be throwing tantrums, they're going to be swearing, they're going to be... Um, having parties, they're not even going to listen to you, they're just going to say, oh, talk to the hand. Right? Now, does God want his children like that? No. He wants us to grow spiritually according to him, according to his character and what his purpose is for our life, so that we could make a difference in the kingdom of God. In heaven? No, on earth. We need to make a difference here. Even though it is difficult. Is it difficult to be disciplined? Amen. Is it uncomfortable to be disciplined? Amen. Is it painful to be disciplined. Any of you been disciplined before? Any of you been disciplined by God? But once we go through the difficult times, the uncomfortable times, the painful times, we come out to be better. Amen. When you discipline your child, your child, he'll probably say, I hate you, or, you know, whatever it's going to be. But when, when he gets through it, and he comes out on the other side, and he has to look back when he gets a bit more wisdom, and he looks back, he's going to understand why. And he's going to be thankful for it. If I think of my youth... And if you think of your youth, I know mine is probably a lot further back than yours, okay? But if you think of your youth and what you went through living in the house that you, went, you lived in, there will be things that you can say, wow, I'm glad that happened to me. The one thing that comes out of my youth that I can remember so well and that is to be grateful for things. We had very little. We were six children. Only my father worked. My mother didn't work. There was very little things extra that we got. Maybe here and there. But when you got something, you were so grateful. 
And then you looked after it. You cherished it because it made you happy. You were so excited to get this little thing because it made you happy and you start you you were always grateful for these things now i look some at sometimes at our youth and i see in some times in some places some teenagers how they have an attitude of but i deserve it you have to give me this because i deserve it they are not grateful at all. Anyone know someone like that? They are not grateful at all for getting things. Whereas they should be. Now, if you had to think in your youth, what did you learn out of your whole, let's say you left the house at 18, from age 1 to 18, the things that were taught to you by your parents... There are good things. Yeah, there's sometimes bad things also. But there, there is at least one good thing that you can say, I'm glad this happened to me. Because now I understand a little bit more about, in my case, gratefulness. Being grateful for something. Now God takes us. And here we are, his children. And as we are growing in the spiritual side of our life. He is disciplining us. And sometimes while you're going through it, it's difficult, it's uncomfortable, and it can be painful. But once you get to the other side and you look back and you think, wow, God, you knew what you were doing. Thank you for teaching me that. And that is what our Father does for us. The same with our Heavenly Father. He loves us too much to leave us as babies for the devil to push around. Our Father in heaven loves us too much to leave us in the baby state. We have to go to toddler, to teenager, to adult and become mature. We have to do that. And it's sometimes uncomfortable. So, and why I'm, why I'm telling you all of this, remember what, what the subject is, love your neighbor. So how many people around you do you not want to associate with because they've done something to you? And here God comes and he disciplines us so that we can grow into maturity and start to look for the good in people. He wants us to grow. He wants us to change, to learn so that we can be successful in his kingdom, even when it's on earth for a while. This is why he does it so that we can be successful in his kingdom. So whatever you are going through in your spiritual life, God is teaching you something. So that when you get through it, you can teach somebody else. Amen? Even though it's difficult, even though it's painful and uncomfortable, we need to grow. We need, one of the things is to love our neighbor. It does not come naturally to us to love everyone around us. Amen. It does not come naturally to love everyone. If somebody has done you wrong, it is extremely uncomfortable to love that person. And I don't know about you, but many people have done many wrong things towards me. And I towards others as well. So when you grow a little bit more in maturity, 
when God as our Father takes you and says, I want to mold you, I want to change you for this one aspect, the second commandment in the Word of God, He wants to change you to love your neighbor. Then you're supposed to say, yes, Lord, bring it on. Change me. Even knowing it's going to be difficult. So, first of all then, if we get to the part of loving your neighbor. The first question people always ask is, okay, who is my neighbor? We all know the parable of the Good Samaritan. You can go and read it in Luke chapter 10. We all know, is there anyone that doesn't know about the Good Samaritan? Okay, you all know about it. There, who was his neighbor? Somebody that he met on the way of traveling along the side of the road. It wasn't the guy that was living next to him. Because when we consider a neighbor, we think of the people living on this side of us and the people living on that side. That's not the same as in the Bible. The neighbor here with the Good Samaritan was he was on his way and he found this man that was needing help along the way. And that would have been his neighbor, even though he did not know him. If we have a look at the word of God concerning the word neighbor, if we go and have a look in the word of God, Matthew 22 verse 39 says, Matthew 22 verse 39, it says, and a second, a second commandment, is like it. Where am I reading this? Matthew is in the New Testament, okay? I'm not reading something out of the Old Testament, even though the Ten Commandments were in the Old Testament as well. I am reading in the New Covenant that we have with God our Father. So whatever is coming in that New Covenant, He is expecting us to do it. So if I go and read in Matthew 22, verse 39, it it says, And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So to love your neighbor is written more times in the New Testament than the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it's written once. In Leviticus. In the New Testament, it's written seven times. So how much more does God want us to love our neighbor? If we go and have a look at the description of what is neighbor, and we go and have a look at this in the Strong's Concordance. In the Strong's Concordance, we have a description of it, Then we have the Greek version of what neighbor means, and then we have the the words that Jesus Christ uses for neighbor itself. So if we have a look in the Hebrew, the Strong's, first of all it says to associate. So if someone associates with you, he's your neighbor. To be near, to be at hand, another person, a fellow citizen, an inhabitant. So he can be a fellow citizen. He can be near me, at hand, another person. Did you know that everyone that is sitting here is your neighbor? Why? Because they are sitting with you. Because you have got to know them. Fellow citizen, they are a fellow citizen in the kingdom of God. Therefore, they are your neighbors. So it's basically anyone that you associate with, God considers as your neighbor. If we have a look at the Greek part in the Strong's Concordance, it says dwelling around. So anyone living around you, according to the Jews, this is what the Greeks said, according to the Jews. Then the third one, any member of 
the Hebrew race according to Christ. Anyone in the Hebrew race. So according to Christ, we have um, any member in the Hebrew race, any other man, irrespective of race or religion, with whom we live or whom we chance to meet. So if he says, yeah, but I've got to love my neighbor, so it's probably just the one next to me here and the one next to me here, and maybe even the people at work that I work with, or the family, or it's anyone you chance to meet is your neighbor. Now the word says, love your neighbor. Loving others is not a choice you can make. You should not be choosing who you love and who you do not love. It's not your choice. If we go according to the word of God, it's a commandment from God to love your neighbor. So, all those, I'm sure all the people that you're thinking of that's going through your mind at the moment is, Ugh, you've got to say, mean, I've got to love that one, and I've got to love that one, and I've got to love this one. No, it's too difficult to be a Christian. Romans 13, verses 9 and 10 says this. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal. Where am I reading this? Romans, the new chapter, new covenant. You shall not covet or have an evil desire for. And any other commandment out of the ten are summed up in a single command. They are summed up, all of those, we can bring them together and sum them up in a single command. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. That's verse 9. Love does no wrong to one's neighbor. So you might be planning on doing something. Yeah, but they did this to me, I'm going to do this to them. It says, love does no wrong to one's neighbor. It never hurts anyone. Love does not hurt anyone. Therefore, love meets all the requirements and is the fulfilling of the law. Amen. When you are loving your neighbor... It is the fulfillment of the law. That's in Romans chapter 13. How many times did you and I miss that this week? How many times did we miss loving your neighbor this month or last month? This, this month's still short. Last month. How many times did we miss it this year? Loving your neighbor. Romans chapter 5, from 1 to 6, and I'm reading this out of the message. From verse 1 to verse 6. Whose phone is that? <laughs> verse 1. Those of us who are strong and able in the faith. Anyone here strong and able? Yes? Okay. Those of us who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter. What am I saying? Anyone that's weak, the strong must help. That's loving your neighbor. And not just do what is most convenient for us. 
So if I'm the strong one, and someone here is going through a very hard time and is weak in the spirit, I need to help them. That is loving my neighbor. Not when it's convenient for me, when that person needs help. Strength is for service, not status. Oh, yes, but you know what? I'm the pastor. That's why I helped. Because I've got the status. I've got the, the uh, title. Let me tell you something. Your title means nothing. Absolutely nothing. Jesus had the title of a king. King over all. Who was he? He was a servant. He served wherever he walked. He served the people. Every time that he could do something, he served the people. And yet, he's the king of kings. So your title means nothing. Verse 2, each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? That is what's got to be right in front of your face here. First thing in your mind, how can I help? Wherever I live and move and have my being, how can I help? That is loving your neighbor. Verse 3, that's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't make it easy for himself by avoiding people's troubles. It's easy to avoid the people's troubles. It's easy to do it. He did not make it easy for himself. He did not avoid the people's troubles. He went and he helped. He was a servant or have a servant's um, attitude. He did not make it easy for himself by avoiding people's troubles, but waded right in and helped out. I took on the troubles of the troubled is the way that scripture puts it. I took on the troubles of the troubled. So if you see someone that is troubled, you are supposed to step in and say, how can I help? That's loving your neighbor. Verse four, even if it was written in scripture long ago, you can be sure it's written for us. If it's in this book, it's for us. God wants the combination of his steady, constant calling and warmth, personal counsel in Scripture to come to characterize us, keeping us alert for whatever he will do next. He wants us to follow in his footsteps. He wants us to be steady in his character so if Jesus served, we must serve. If Jesus helped, we must help. Verse 5. May our dependable, steady, and warmly personal God develop maturity in you and me so that you can get along with each other as well as Jesus gets along with all of us. Who of you is glad that Jesus is the strong one and we are the weak? And that he says, how can I help you? Amen? This is exactly what Jesus does. His whole word is, let me train you. Let me help you. Let me equip you to become the best that you can do. He says in his word, when you are weak... I am strong, he says. When you need help, where does it come from? I take my eyes and look up to the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from there. So just as Jesus loves us, we must love our neighbor. And who is our neighbor? Everyone around us. Everyone we associate with. 
is our helper. Then we'll be a choir, he says. Not our voices only, but our very lives, everything we do, singing in harmony in a stunning anthem to the God and Father of our Master Jesus. The message says it so nicely. If we love our neighbor like Jesus loves us, it will be like a harmonious anthem before the throne of God. Galatians 5, from verse 13 to 15, says this. For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Who's free in the house? Amen? Jesus says, if he set you free, you're free indeed. So we're free. But now he says, for you, brethren, were called to to freedom. Yes, we've been called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh. Don't think I'm free, so that's all I need. Do not let it be an incentive, something that you receive to your flesh, and an opportunity or an excuse for selfishness. Do not let your freedom, being set free by Jesus Christ, cause you to be selfish. But through love, you should serve one another. Don't be selfish and keep it all to yourself. Your freedom you received freely. But the word says, freely you have received, freely you should give. So if you've received this freedom, do not be selfish. Help the next person as well. Help your neighbor. Verse 14, for the whole law concerning human relationships is compiled within the one precept, the whole law comes down to one thing. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. When Jesus walked on earth, if he did not love his neighbor, where would we be? Verse 5, but if you bite and devour one another, Be careful that you and your whole fellowship, whoever is with you, are not consumed by one another. Do not bite and devour one another. Love your neighbor. Loving your neighbor, if you go and read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and you go and read from verse 4 to 8, you will see exactly what love means. How we are supposed to relate to one another, how we are supposed to help one another in love. Maybe some of you at some other time think about, oh no, this is going to be too difficult. I don't have the time to help other people. I'm not a people person, so that does it, then it's not for me. We cannot tear out pages out of the Bible and say, that's not for me. This Bible is for the children of God. Who's a child of God? This is for you. Not half of it. Not three quarters of it, not seven eighths of it. This book, this Bible, from cover to cover, is for you and for me. 
no matter how difficult. I can't believe God would ask me to love the Satanists, to love the rapist, to love the person who molested me, the man who stole everything from under me, the woman who destroyed my reputation, my future, the troublemaker, the one that gossips and gossips and gossips. I don't think God will ask me to love them. That's what we do. Yet God says, who is your neighbor? Those that you associate with. And then he says, and love them. You see, you do not love what they're doing. God loves us, but he does not love the sin that we do. He loves us, the created being that he made. And he will discipline us and help us to grow into a better person. So yes, there are consequences for everything that we do. But God says, love your neighbor. No matter who that neighbor is. God commands us to do it. Just as a good father commands his children to do things. If you are a good father, you will be teaching your child from a very young age to do things in the house. You will teach them to pick up their clothes. You will teach them to maybe take out the garbage. You will teach them to go and fetch a cup. You will teach them things at that level as a good father. Why do you teach them to do it? because you want to build in them the best that they can achieve. I think the most difficult thing for a parent to teach a child, but they have to be taught it, and that is endurance. Because a child will go and do something, and they'll get halfway and become bored, and then, ah, oh, no, just leave it. Push it under the table, push it under the bed. It's not for me and they don't finish. That's childlike. It should not be happening in us as adults. But even it does. It all depends where you are in your spiritual level. You could perhaps look at me and say, okay, you're an adult, you've got quite a few years in. But my spirit could be a baby. So my spirit has to grow. So God is going to grow my spirit by giving me things to do. And if he gave me, um, let's say being an usher, if the Lord spoke to me and he said, that's what I want you to do in the church, I want you to be an usher. To be an usher, you have to be here every Sunday. You have to be available to be able to do the things that are necessary. You can even have to clean the toilets, um, make coffee for someone. Whatever the case is, you're a servant. You are serving. If you come one week and then you skip three, and then you come one week and you skip another three, and then eventually you say, oh, no, you know what, this isn't for me. You should be past that stage. You should be enduring. You should be doing your stuff to the fullest, completely without stopping. That's what God wants us to do. So, so as we teach that little child to complete the tasks that are given to them, so God wants us to complete the tasks 
that he gives to us. Because some tasks last for years. Some tasks are quick and they're done within a week. But even if you get bored, even if you don't feel like it, he expects you to finish what you started. And loving your neighbor is something that he puts into your heart. Like this morning, you are now all hearing about love your neighbor. Now, everyone knows you're supposed to love your neighbor. But how is loving your neighbor in your life? Are you still enduring? No matter who's coming across your path. Are you still continuing to love your neighbor? Because loving your neighbor is not one little task that's over in a month. Loving your neighbor is when you give your heart to the Lord, this task starts. And it will not finish until the day you lay down your head. Sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we get bored. But when we are weak, God is strong. We have a Father who has given us His Holy Spirit, a very piece of Him He's given to us so that when we are weak, we can call on him and he will work through us. We have everything. God equips us with everything. We just sometimes need to say, flesh, you will do what the spirit tells you to do. We have to look past the things that are bad in a person and see the potential of the good things, the attributes that God created them with. We have to have a look at the godly things in that person. We have to love them with agape love and we need to show them this love. Amen? What do we normally do? First of all, we look at the bad in that person. Yeah, but that person's not doing this, they're not doing this, they're not doing this, and they irritate me, and they, um, they're swearing, and they're smoking, and they're drinking, and they How can I love someone like that? Are they your neighbor? If they are, then the Word of God commands you to get past all of your agitations all your irritations and look for something in them where you can see God is working at that point and love them because you see that in them. Everyone has good points. Not, not, a bad person is not just bad. Everyone has good points. And to love your neighbor, you need to search for those good points and work with that. So that you can eventually get them stronger in the kingdom of God. Or even if they're not yet Christians, you can get them to change their lives and turn their lives around. By what they see, you changing them like that. Showing them agape love. Many people say, I love them, but I don't like them. Doesn't work like that. Can you imagine if Jesus turned around and said, yeah, I'll love you, but I don't like you. And there's a lot in each one of us that Jesus would, could turn around and say, I don't like that. Jesus loves us and he accepts us for who we are. He disciplines us so that we can change. But he still loves us for who we are. 
And none of us is perfect. There is something in your life, there is something in my life that somebody does not like. And really, if you start to think about it, you could actually identify it. I know I irritate people because when I want something done, I want it done now and I want it done right. Some people don't like that. But we, we have to accept the people for who they are. We need to love them like Jesus loves us. Because if it had to come to a push where Jesus had to say, all right, if I don't like something in you, you're not going to heaven. No one would go to heaven. And then I say again, you don't have to like the sin in that person. You don't have to like the sin in that person but you need to love the person that God our Father made. Because God loves me, he accepts me. Not for any other reason. Because God loves me, he accepts me. Because he loves me, he forgives me. Because he loves me, he teaches me. Because he loves me, he has patience with me. Because he loves me, his grace and his mercy are enough. Now I want you to get somebody in your mind that is your neighbor. Think of that one person that you don't like spending time with. Because you love them, you accept them. Because you love them, you forgive them. Because you love them, you teach them. Because you love them, you will have patience with them. And everyone's nodding. Good. Because you love them, your grace and your mercy are enough. Amen? Do you treat people as God treats you? If not change. It's as easy as that. Make the choice to change. And remember, every time you fail, because there are going to be times that you fail, every time you fail, there will be another opportunity to try again. Amen? Don't give up. Don't give up because you failed once and you thought, oh, I just can't do this. Don't give up. Practice. When you go to do something new, you practice until it becomes perfect. So choose someone this week that you know is your neighbor, that you associate with, but you really don't like them, and make the choice to love them like Jesus loves you. Amen? Let's stand. Come, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this morning. Thank you that you are the best Father that we can have. Thank you that you teach us, you train us with your Holy Spirit. You stand by us. You are never weak. You are always the strong one. Thank you that you help us and you equip us to do the things that are necessary in our lives. And as you've brought out 
this subject to us, the commandment that you have for us to love our neighbor, we need a lot of help, Lord. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will lead us and guide us, walk in front of us and help us to love our neighbors. Your word says you will bring into remembrance everything that you have taught us. So as we go through this week, bring it into our remembrance. Let us identify the people that are our neighbor and how we can help them. Let them see you, Jesus, in us. It doesn't matter if they fail. It doesn't matter if we fail. We can always stand up again and try with the next one. Give us the wisdom that we need for this and the strength and saturate us with the spirit of obedience of your word to help us to do this. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.